Hello everyone and welcome back to the Belgian Beer Brothers channel. My name is Cedric and today we are gonna talk about another Geus beer uh, even though there is a slight point of discussion whether this should be called a Geus or not. We are talking about Geus Bellevue today. Uh, here in Belgium most people will know Bellevue from the Creek, uh, Creek beer from the commercials and then nu ne Creek Bellevue. Um, actually they started out as Lambic Brewery. No, actually they were not a brewery, they were a blendery. For this brewery we have to go back in time quite a lot, again as usual. We have to go back to 1913 uh, where 23 year olds Bar owner Philemon van de Stock from Brussels used to buy lambic and blended fongeurs, as they said. So, not oude geurs, but just geurs for his own bar. And of course, uh, that was a great success. Many people did that in those days. But 1913, as in many stories, is just before World War I. Unfortunately, things went downhill for a while, <coughs> but after the war, I hope you guys can't hear this noise, after the war things went well again and in 1927 he moved to Café Bellevue in Anderlecht. Now for the football fans or the soccer fans amongst you, you've heard Van der Stock, you've heard Anderlecht and yes you are right, uh, but that's for later in the story. So, he bought Café Bellevue in Anderlecht, uh, it's outside of Brussels, and he started blending Lambic again in Café Bellevue, and he sold it in Café Bellevue, and sold it as well to five other bars, and yeah, straight to the general public as well. And the pub, as well as the Lambic business, kept growing. It actually kept growing so good that in 1943, so in the middle of World War II, Philemon acquired Voskina, uh, a Lambic brewery and Moultrie in Sint Jans Molenbeek. And yeah, of course he got the chance to do this because Bellevue was thriving while all other uh, breweries were slowly sliding downhill. But having a brewery and maltry of his own meant that Philemon now could brew his own Lambic. Also in 1943, his son Constant van der Stock, and bells are going off for the soccer fans now, uh, because Anderlecht had the Constant van der Stock stadium, and that is of course named after him. The family van der Stock has always been yeah, well intertwined in the soccer world. And you can read more about this on uh, a book I reviewed a while ago called Brussels Beer City by Egan Walsh. Apart from that. So, Constant van der Stock and Philemon's son-in-law, Octave Collin van der Stock, join in the business and join him in the management ranks. Unfortunately, two years, uh, one year later, 1944, Philemon is arrested by the occupying Nazi forces and he is sent to Neuengammer uh, concentration camp. Luckily for Philemon, one year later, 1945, in May, the Neuengammer camp is liberated, but he didn't have much joy from that because one week later, Constant, uh, Philemon dies and Constant has to take over the brewery. So. After one week of joy of having his father back and then straightly into mourning, Constant gets the challenge of running his own brewery along with the pubs and immediately he starts changing things. He uh, basically changed everything. He changed the complete production process. Uh, for example, he 
started adding artificial flavorings. He started uh, using sweeteners. He started filtering the beer. He started pasteurizing the beer. He started carbonating the beer. So as you might notice, uh, nothing from the classic Geus or Lambic is preserved. And he actually does this as well as um, saying farewell to the, the classic 75 centiliter bottles and introducing the 25 centiliter bottles like, like this one right here. All to cater to a larger audience, the audience that actually drinks the pale lagers and the pilsners, which yeah, started growing and growing and growing in that time. And up until today, as we're gonna see in the next few weeks, uh, Pilsner is still yeah, the largest portion of the beer consumption in Belgium and actually all over Europe, I believe. Anywho, so he starts changing all those things and he actually lucked out on all those changes uh, for one silly reason and that is because the, the Lambic season 1949-1950, there was a huge heat wave. So, as you guys might remember from the Tour de Geus uh, series, Lambic is brewed in winter and then ripened and it takes quite some time. Now, that means that fermentation still goes on with the local microorganisms from the air and from the water, from the Zena. And warmed is actually a catalyst for the fermentation process. Uh, it is an exothermal reaction. So the yeast and the, the microorganisms eat the sugar and then poop out alcohol and carbon dioxide, CO2. And in the process they generate heat. But if you introduce heat to this process up until a certain uh, temperature remember low fermentation high fermentation about 16 degrees about 26 degrees but you can speed up this process by introducing warmth now too much heat and your yeast will start uh, secreting byproducts that you don't want some other esters and some some uh, yeah flavors that we don't need and don't want, like cat pee and ammonia. On the other hand, this can speed up this fermentation process so well that they start producing so much carbon dioxide and so much pressure in the bottles that all the bottles will start exploding. And that is exactly what happened with almost all of the competitors in the 1949-1950 season. So while many, many breweries suffered from uh, yeah, popping corks and exploding bottles, Bellevue was the only use that was pasteurized, meaning all the microorganisms were killed off and there was no re-fermentation. So the bottles didn't get reactivated and they couldn't explode because the pressure in the bottles was constant. Of course, they really had a lot of luck with that. And that was their cue to uh, grow even more. They rose to the top because they were the sole competitor. There was no competition, so they were the only ones. And if you're the only competitor, yeah, you're bound to be number one, of course. That also drove them to raise production and start selling across the whole country and even export to France and the Netherlands. And that's actually where it really took off for Bellevue because they they already had thrived for, for let's say 30 years after the First World War. And having so much luck with this one season and conquering almost the entire market, that was yeah too much luck. This of course led to a serious recession amongst these brewers in the 50s because they lost a lot of stock and remember that Old Heurs is a blend of not one but four 
seasons so they lost a lot of stock from the last four seasons meaning they have to build up stock for the next four seasons again and in the meantime they can only sell, sell young lambic but of course the more lambic you sell the less capacity you have for your old years because you have to ripen and age your lambic and at this point Bellevue or the family Vanderstock swooped in and acquired a lot of other breweries now I'm just gonna name a few I'm not gonna list everything and I'm not gonna tell you guys the history of all of these breweries but for example um, in the 50s they acquired a bunch of them and then they did some huge acquisitions because of course they weren't the only ones with money left there were a few other big ones and in 1962 they did their first huge acquisition of one of those big ones so in the 50s they acquired many smaller breweries meanwhile growing their capacity and in 1962 Constance's son Roger and Roger's cousin Philippe joined the brewery and that's where it all starts getting really uh, yeah, easy for the Bellevue family or the, the Vanderstock family because of course in the 50s they weren't the only ones with money left there were a few other big ones and Bellevue as well as those others started munching up all the small breweries but in 1969 they had a, a real breakthrough and they bought Les Brasseries Unies or the United Breweries and as the name <laughs> already tells you um, these were already some United Breweries namely um, De Boek and Gholsens those were two larger breweries that had together already acquired brewery De Kroon, Toussaint, De Koster, Hermans and Van de Kerkhoven. So these are actually seven of their competitors that they pick up in one swoop. And then in 1970, one year later, they bought uh, Barbux. And Barbux is also one of those thriving uh, breweries at the time. And they already bought the Keersmaker Van Hale Kosch. Bekas Stepe and Van de Perre. So another five. They are combined with the others that they bought in the 50s. At this point in 1970, they owned about 75% of the Lambic production in Belgium. In 1975, they also bought De Neve. And they almost had the whole market. Now bear in mind that um, of course there is Guzerie Boom, but not back then because that was only started in 1978 and we're talking 1970-75 here. So it was a bold move by Frank Boom, still starting up a Guzerie to take on this, this monster. Somewhere around 80 ish Bellevue wants to export more not only France and the Netherlands they want to export to a bunch of countries and for this they need help they need a network they need contacts so they ask for help and they get this in the form of a partnership with Artois uh, that everyone knows under the name Stella Artois in Leuven and they get a lot of help but they traded in for a minority share of 43% in their brewery. So now Artois owns 43% of Brasserie Bellevue, of Guzerie Bellevue. Now in 1988, uh, a huge merger in the beer world takes place. Of course, I never actively uh, endured this because I was only one year old, but in 1988, uh, Artois and Pierre Boeuf merge, and Pierre Boeuf is better known as Jubilère. And Artois and Jubilère, the two Pilsner giants from Belgium, merge and become Interbrew. Now, 
while starting Interbrew, they also buy out the van der Stock family. So this is where the, the story of the van der Stock family in the beer world ends, or at least in Bellevue ends. Now, of course, van der Stock, uh, the family still had a lot of political influence and were involved in soccer and a lot of other ventures, uh, but they were bought out of their brewery. Today, a lot has happened. Uh, Interbrew once was the biggest Belgian brewery and um, they still have that reputation although they are actually not Belgian anymore they are dare I say Brazilian because now they are AB InBev or Anheuser Busch InBev and they are yeah not much more than a conglomerate uh, investment group buying and selling and yeah ruining basically breweries of course, since Bellevue is not because they are owned uh, by AB InBev, but because they actually don't have anything to do with traditional Lambic brewing, they are not a member of Horal. Nor will they be in the future. Why do I say they have nothing to do with the traditional brewing process? Well, because they actually change the process completely. You can think about this what you want. And actually it's not really a stupid move, but during fermentation or actually after brewing, they don't use a open cool ship anymore. They actually cool their beer like any other beer in a controlled way over a heat exchanger. The cooled beer goes into a tank and inside that tank uh, compre compressed air from outside is introduced but normally we filter the air, we, we sterilize the air and in this process the air is not sterilized. So the, the cooling down over a heat exchanger and then introducing compressed outside air that's called as the DKZ method or the Kirschmaker Zun method and the Kirschmaker and Zun are the two researcher, uh, researchers that developed and introduced this method. What Bellevue also does during this step is add in some uh, older aged lambic to the tank and that actually only has one reason and this is because in a uh, Yeah, one of the, the laws stating this production method for Geus, not Audi Geus, Geus, says that since 1993 you have to blend in older Lambic to be able to call your beer Geus on the label. And that's what they do. They don't specify, they don't do anything with it. We are going to have a look at the label in a moment. But that's why they can call this Geus. But for all intents and purposes, this is actually a um, artificially sweetened, uh, filtered, pasteurized, and overall, yeah, weird uh, mass production lambic. Little fun fact. Um, when they started exporting to France, the Bellevue name was already trademarked. And there they, it's sold under La Bécasse. Uh, La Bécasse is the name of a Brussels brewery that they took over way back in the days. Um, but if you have La Bécasse Geus, it's basically the same, it's just differently labeled. Now if we take a look at this label, it does have the new logo um, but it still says Geus Lambic aged in barrels okay let's believe that minimum 33% wheat aromatized with herbs 
no idea which ones or whatever still says Bruxelles 1913 Brussels Bellevue and Philemon van de Stock back label isn't much more interesting it does say that this typical Brussels beer is ripened as tradition <laughs> yeah really in oak barrels aromatized with citrus peel and coriander okay I am very curious now about the glass this is uh, actually a yeah a merger between a flute and a classic lambic glass it has a thick bottom also not that thick uh, quite thin glass but I like the tulip form but these days um, Gus Bellevue is actually served in more like a Pilsner glass and way back in the day so I'll put a picture somewhere here they had some weird shapes of glasses and they had all kinds of glasses so a Sweden pasteurized lambic years okay got interrupted there for a second let's have a taste smell good actually slightly sweet and sour now when I opened the bottle I didn't see that many bubbles but it isn't a very active beer of course very nice head of foam of course that's one of the reasons why I love this kind of glass it has this shape that makes the foam come out very very nicely it has the lovely colors it does have a lovely color it's a very golden brown ale golden yellow dark yellow slightly off-white foam some nice purling the sourness in the scent is almost gone but of course this is a glass that it opens up wide so a lot of the uh, yeah the thin aromas are gone first it smells rather fruity and sweet right now but there is quite a bit of sourness in the taste left um, it's not a sharp sourness it's not acidity it's more like a, a lemony sourness it does taste sweetened it's actually like <laughs> sour candy maybe the smell is rather malty now which is yeah quite rare for a ghost I might not have served it as chilled as I should have <coughs> but yeah I don't I nearly don't taste any alcohol in there of course that that's not an obligation uh, it is a 5.5 percent ABV so it's quite neutral but actually that's the word that describes this beer most it's neutral it is a, a curse only by yeah by some legal trickery and I would actually not even recommend this as a starter curse uh, honestly I think this is a curse for a supermarket because then you have a curse for everyone and of course no one will dislike this because it's too strong or too sour or too anything and maybe for a pub just to have a in your range 
Um, but honestly, most pubs were, that I work with, I recommend Hearst Boom. Uh, because quality and price, it is the best. <coughs> but this, yeah, I would personally, I'm not gonna pour it down the sink. It's too nice to pour down the sink. Uh, but I am not gonna buy it again and I am not gonna recommend it to affiliates or to colleagues. Um, actually, uh, one of our viewers, one of our beer brothers uh, suggested to maybe start scoring beers. Um, and since I actually do in Untapped, maybe I should just start <laughs> telling you my score here. And of course the scores uh, can depend and that's mainly why I don't do it uh, up until now. Scores can severely depend on 